um, and, and uh, redesigned a lot of systems. We put a lot of new materials in. You heard the term beta cloth. Well, that that's where beta cloth came from back in those days. We had to have a non-flammable material that we could use in the command module, uh, and we used it everywhere. And it was a, it was a good thing to do. The thing that killed the guys on on, on Apollo One was foam rubber. They had coated all the instrument panels with foam rubber so they wouldn't hurt anything if they bumped into it. And they were doing a pressure check down on the uh, on the pad, and they and they and they pumped up the spacecraft at 21 psi pure oxygen. Well, pure oxygen and foam rubber in the, abs in, in, the in the presence of a spark is explosive. <coughs> really, really bad. <coughs> When they got the spark, it was all over for those guys in about 30 seconds. Uh, consider what happens to the hatch on, 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 on Apollo 1. The original the hatch, problem, is I, I don't know why they didn't do it to begin with, but I think they were concerned about this pressure thing. <coughs> uh, so anyway, I was so heavily involved with the command module that that's how I got on it. That's, that's, I, I became an expert in the, in, the, in the command service model. I wrote all the malfunction procedures. Um, we did a lot of the onboard procedures. We did. Um, all the safety procedures, the manuals, all that kind of stuff. And by the time you get through all that, after a year and a half, they're not going to—they're not going to put you in a lunar module. You know, Jim Irwin did the same thing with the lunar module, so that's why he became a lunar module. Pilot. So that's how we got the slot that we got. Um, uh, after dinner, I went back to my room in the crew quarters and went to bed and went right to sleep. It was just absolutely comfortable. Got up the next morning. Uh, put on a bathrobe, went down, got a final physical exam, went to the next room down the hall, and this is where it really started to get weird. Went down to the next room down the hall where they had a barber and we got a haircut. See, who do you think we're going to see out there? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of nonsense is this? Anyway, uh, then we went down to the, our dining room and got our last breakfast, uh, which was uh, in the terminology of the day was a low residual breakfast, and you can figure that out. <laughs> um, and then we came down to the suit room, we started, uh, we put on the suits, we started pre-breathing oxygen so that we wouldn't get the bends if we lost cabin pressure on the way to orbit. The same thing as deep sea divers, but you know, you got to get the nitrogen on your system. So here we are, um, getting, uh, getting suited up and uh, breathing uh, pure oxygen. Uh, at the right time, I guess it was about, uh, you know, it's been so long ago, I, I forget the exact times, but long about uh, 7 o'clock, we got in the van and drove it's seven miles from the crew quarter out to the launch pad. Uh, kind of an eerie morning. Uh, the, the, the launch vehicle had been fueled up uh, over the days, the two or three days leading up to the launch. And for instance, the first stage was kerosene and, and liquid oxygen. Uh, the second stage was liquid <coughs> hydrogen, liquid oxygen, and the third stage was liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. Well, you know, liquid hydrogen is what, minus 350 degrees. Oxygen's the same thing, you know, minus 250, something like that. So what had happened is that over the two or three days when they had this very, very cold liquid loaded into the launch vehicle, it started to cold soak through the walls. And if you've ever been to Florida, you know what I'm talking about. It's very, very humid down there. Mm -hmm. And ice started forming on the outside of the launch vehicle. And the ice got up to about an inch and a half thick. The shuttles had some of those problems too. Um, we rode up the elevator to the 35th floor, and, and it was kind of funny because it was, it was, it was a glass elevator. It was sort of like the kind of elevators you see in modern hotels where you go up in this glass tube kind of thing. Well, we had one of those, and it went, the, the elevator went right up, eh, let's see, yeah, here's, here's the elevator right here. Goes right up here, and we had, you can see here, uh, you can't see it very well, but that's the, that, that's the catwalk that goes across to the <coughs> command module. Got off the 35th floor, walked out. It was kind of funny. The, it, it, the catwalk was made out of uh, open steel mesh, both sides and then the bottom. And uh, they had the sides and the bottom covered with canvas, so you couldn't see through. And I asked the ground crew out there one time, why, why, why do you cover this, this catwalk? I mean, so you can't see through, you know, you can't see down further ground. Well, some of the earlier guys that were out here doing some tests, they were in their suits and, and they're coming across the catwalk and we didn't have a canvas and one of them looked down and saw the ground and grabbed the handrails and wouldn't let go. He froze in the catwalk. You know, astronauts are really brave.
so they so they covered it with canvas. So they knew it had it anyway, we got it all strapped in. Uh, the ground crew uh, uh, put all the straps on us, oxygen hoses, radios, and all that kind of stuff. Closed the hatch, put on the heat shield, broke down the clean room. They got in their car and drove away. Um, there's a uh, there is a radius around uh, those Apollos, the the Saturn V launches. There's a there's a radius within which you cannot be during a launch because if it explodes, you're in danger. Okay, and that radius happened to be three and a half miles. The explosion would be. If the thing exploded, it would be so big that if you're within three and a half miles, it's probably going to kill you. Well, I guess what the three of us thought about when we sit in the middle of the room, <laughs> that is kind of a funny thing. But now we, by then we were so fatalistic in our outlook, in our in our, in, in our in our in our mind. You know, it's the kind of thing you commit yourself to doing, and you say, "Hey, I, you know, I'm going to do this." It's for, it's for the, my country, it's a great cause, and if we get back, we're going to be this and this and this and this. And if we don't come back, we're going to be in the history books forever. Okay, so it's, it's, it's kind of an Asian mentality about, you know, fatalistic uh, uh, futures. Uh, so we didn't let it bother us. Uh, as a matter of fact, Jim and, Irwin, Jim and Irwin and I went to sleep for a while waiting for launch. And we left Dave up to answer the radios. And 15 minutes before launch, they woke us up and... You know, off we went. Now, this thing, I, I, I don't know, I'm sure you've all seen, or maybe, maybe you haven't, I don't know, but it's been so many years, but if you've ever seen a Saturn V launch on television, you'll get part of the impact of what that launch is. Um, our machine is 363 feet long, weighs 7 million pounds, and, and the thrust to get it off the ground is seven, about 7.5 seven million pounds. This is this this is the largest machine that's uh, the largest vehicle that's ever been launched from the surface or the heaviest vehicle that's ever been launched from the surface of the Earth. And in fact, Apollo 15 still holds the record for the most mass placed in the lunar orbit. Um, all that says is that when you're lifting seven million pounds off the launch pad, and you got that seven and a half million pounds of thrust, your weight is almost equal to the thrust level. So it's very slow coming up. There's none of this fast acceleration that people talk about. Very slow. It took us 12 seconds to get past the launch tower. It took us 12, almost 13 minutes to get into orbit at 90 miles, which is 40 miles lower than the other Apollos. A very, very slow process. The, the, the accelerations, well, when you're sitting on the surface, the, the acceleration is 1G, right? I mean, we're in 1G right now. This is one gravity acting on us. Um, as you launch and you burn out fuel, you get lighter and you still got the same thrust, so you accelerate. And we're about four and a half Gs at the end of the first stage burnout. Uh, big surprise at the end of the first stage burnout. The sequence should have been uh, engine shut down, explosive bolts, release it, release the first stage, retro rockets fire to pull it back from the second stage, right? Well, I didn't realize it. But that was not the sequence we had. Well, I found out on the flight. But the sequence was engine shut down, <laughs> retro rockets fire, and then the explosive bolts go. Well, what that did to us was we're going four and a half Gs at cutoff. Then cuts off, the retro rockets fire, and all of a sudden we're in a half a G negative instantly. And we're, you no, know, the four and a half Gs are pushing us into the couches, and the half G is pushing us the, uh, the other way. Scared the hell out of Jim and I. We didn't know what was going on. <laughs> Looked over at Dave and asked, Dave, boy, we didn't expect that. And he said, gee guys, I forgot to tell you about 